Hi. In this lesson, I want to go a step further than just talking in generalities about what makes a good zone fossil. I want us to look at groups of different fossils and try and evaluate how good they would be to use to date rocks. Now for this lesson, you will need a copy of the Evaluating Zone Fossils handout and perhaps as well the notes that you made about the different fossil groups uh, from earlier in this topic. Okay then, let's go. On your handout, you'll see the main characteristics of um, good zone fossils listed at the top of this table. Down the left hand side there, we've got uh, the different groups of fossils that we study. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about each of these groups in terms of whether they're uh, fasces independent, whether they evolve rapidly, whether they're widely distributed, um, their abundance, their preservation, their identification. And from that to try and evaluate whether there are uh, any use as a zone fossil. Now you can see on this on the worked examples I've given you here, I some of these I've ticked where um, this particular group of, uh, uh, of organisms uh, is, is good at that particular thing. So for example, for the birds, they are fasces independent. They don't live in one particular sedimentary environment because they fly. So we tick that because that's a good feature for use as a zone fossil. Um, and I've even put in brackets there a little very brief explanation of that. The rapid evolution though, we don't see that so much. So that's a cross. Okay. For some that well, we're not quite sure about or where well, it may be um, good, may not be so good, I've used a question mark. Okay. Now, if we look at birds here, we can see although they're fa fasces independent and widely distributed and easily identified, because they don't evolve rapidly, they weren't particularly abundant in the past and they're certainly not easily preserved. They don't make good fossils. Uh, birds are not used at all as zone fossils. Brachiopods, on the other hand, easily identified, easily preserved, the evolution and the fasces independence not not fantastic um, means we only use them really uh, in the Ordovician period. What I'd like you to do is have a go at filling in the rest. Now it may be a good idea to do this in pencil first of all but I think it's important that you try and think for yourself about uh, evaluating each of these characteristics for each of these groups. Do it in pencil. If there are any you're really not sure about, just leave it blank and we'll go through the answers shortly. Okay? So have a go at that now. Press pause on the video. See what you can come up with. Okay then, let's have a look at some, uh, well, what I think about each of these groups. Let's start with the bivalves here. Let me fill in some boxes here. So, the bivalves uh, are a little bit fasces independent. They do occur in lots of different environments, although individuals don't spread uh, you know, that much. They do, at some points in geological history, um, evolve rapidly. They are very widely distributed and very, very abundant. Uh, as a small invertebrate shellfish, they preserve easily and we can easily identify them. So, for bivalves, they're actually fair, you know, fairly good but they're really confined to specific periods. We use them in the Carboniferous and we use them in the Cretaceous periods.
If we look at the cephalopods, this includes uh, fossil groups like the ammonites. You can see there from the, uh, from the number of ticks that we have uh, for this particular group, they're free swimmers, they're fasces independent, they evolve rapidly, they were distributed all over the place, massively abundant at uh, points in time, very easily preserved, very easily identified, and they are very good zone fossils. Um, in particular for the Mesozoic, but also uh, for part of the late Paleozoic as well. Okay, these are very, very good ones. Corals. Corals are very fussy about where they live. It's a very limited number uh, condition group. No. It's a very limited set of conditions in which they live. So they're not independent from fasces. They did evolve rapidly, but because of their um, fussiness about the environment, they weren't widely distributed around the world. Very abundant, very easily preserved. They're very robust things and very easily identified. As a result, they're, they're really only fair. Where they do come into their own, though, is the Carboniferous period. Graptolites, then. You can see here, tick a lot of the boxes. The only one they don't uh, really tick is the fact that they're not easily preserved. They're really quite fragile uh, organisms. We only tend to find them preserved in deep ocean sediments, where there's anaerobic conditions and low energy levels. As a result, as uh, zone fossils, they're very good, but in particular for the Ordovician and Silurian periods. And it so happens that we find a lot of deep, deep ocean sediments of that age, which allows us to use these things. Okay, if we keep on moving our way down the, the handout here, we've got our plants. You can see here, plants are not independent of fasces, didn't evolve particularly rapidly, although they were widely distributed and abundant, and they're certainly not easily preserved. As a result, their use as a zone fossil is fairly poor. Uh, and really confined to the upper Carboniferous. These are the cold swamp uh, periods. Um, yeah, very limited use, and we don't spend a lot of time really looking at these, and certainly in terms of zone fossils at all. Now the trilobites, do tick a lot of the boxes. They're free swimmers, they did evolve rapidly, no, we think widely distributed, certainly abundant and preserved and identified, a very diverse group. However, they, the period of time where they are uh, most abundant um, is really only the Cambrian, maybe going into the Ordovician. So their, their use of zone fossils in the Cambrian is, is excellent. Everywhere else, though, we don't really use them. And trace fossils? I think the uh, the number of crosses there tells you uh, how useful these are. Uh, we don't use them. Uh, um, they're poor zone fossils. So, as we watch the sunset logo uh, of the town of Fossil in Oregon, we can see that different fossils are have different uh, usefulness as zone fossils. Some of these groups are tremendously useful. They, they literally tick all our boxes for um, the key things we need to see uh, to be able to use a fossil for dating. As a result of this, of all the groups of fossils that we need to be aware of for A-level geology, we focus on two 
for their use as zone fossils. And they're the two best ones we've just identified. So we look at the cephalopods and we look at the graptolites. So we need to understand what the evolutionary trends of those two groups of, of fossils are. But that's for another lesson. I'll see you then.